gypsies. Listen close, I am a craft master. Grind now and know the shine coming after. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to this edition of the Craft Master Podcast. Today, I am honored to present to you guys a living legend. He has written and co-created some of the most iconic cartoons to ever touch television. Scooby-Doo, Sonic the Hedgehog, The Flintstones, he is the Inspector Gadget, Hello Kitty, and the list goes on. He has also won two Emmys, two Humanitarian Awards, five Golden Reel Awards, inducted into the Kids Screen Hall of Fame. Currently, he's the CEO of Genius Brand International. He is a living legend. I am honored to call him a mentor and a friend. The Craft Master Podcast would love to present to you guys, Andy Hayward. What's going on, Andy? Thank you, Prince. Uh, the, thank you for that kind introduction, which I will, uh, I'm very flattered by. Thank you. I'll do my best to live up to all the kind words you said. Of course, man. Of course, man. How's everything been with you since uh, the pandemic is it? Well, it's an adjustment. It's an adjustment for us all. But, uh, you know, I always uh, say I wouldn't trade my worst day uh, for anybody else's best day. I'm blessed. I'm very fortunate. I have wonderful family, uh, good, uh, my health. And, uh, you know, we, we move forward every day. We bring positive energy. Beautiful, beautiful. Recently, you released the cartoon channel talk to me about what your vision is and what you foresee for it well cartoon channel is a free on-demand service where kids can see cartoons that are non-violent that have positive messaging and uh uh, are, I'm going to say, things that we could all feel proud of, and hopefully we can learn from some of them. I tried to have enrichment in every episode. Today, the various outlets for children to watch television are becoming increasingly expensive because they're subscription products, whether it's Netflix or whether it's Disney Plus or now HBO Max, they all cost money. So I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could have a product for kids to see that was absolutely free. And the way of doing that, of course, is to have it advertiser supported. So we have a, a minimal advertising load on there, not, not imposing at all. And the cartoons have been curated to be things that kids can learn from and they can be enriching and have positive values and show important things like inclusivity and, 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 and positivity and diversity in, 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 in every show. How has viewership been? I'm sure it's, it's gone up since everyone is home. Well, you're right. You know, the pandemic has been such a terrible thing. But at the same time, kids being home, viewership has gone up. So we try to uh, uh, make it available everywhere. We're actually in about over 90% of all U.S. TV households right now. You can get it online at cartoonchannel.com. It's also available on Amazon Prime, Amazon Fire, Apple iOS, Apple TV, Comcast, Cox, Dish, Roku, Tubi, a variety of different OTT apps, and, uh, and at, com at com uh, cartoonchannel.com online. So it's pretty accessible and viewership is going up uh, continuously. Uh, more and more kids are at home, and we recently added a segment in there called Cartoon Classroom. So there are uh, a very uh, significant number of our programs that kids can learn different curriculums from. We have a show called Warren Buffett's Secret Millionaires Club, where kids learn lessons in business. We have a show called Thomas Edison's Secret Lab, where science is put forth. We have shows like Llama Llama, where a single mom is raising her family and uh, we learn values and, and imparting her values to the kids. There's a lot of uh, positive things in there. And, you know, I'm trying now to just have programs that I think uh, bring sunshine and good, good messaging for kids. So we don't need another uh, uh, 12 pounds of pastrami. We've done all that. <laughs> My niece loves Llama Llama. Like she loves oh, it. She, <laughs> she oh. loves <laughs> it. She, it calms her down. It's like, She's about two years old. I remember yeah. one time she was she was crying. 
crying so much. And I was talking to my sister-in-law and I was like, Rosie, <laughs> why is she crying? She's like, oh, I got something for it. She put on Llama Llama. And my niece just got quiet. She was like to that. the TV. <laughs> Well bless, well, bless her heart. When we're done, uh, give me her information and I'll send her some Lama Lama stuff. You know, there were 30 million Lama Lama books sold. And uh, Lama Lama is uh, produced originally for Netflix. But we are also running some shorts and promotional items of Lama Lama on the Cartoon Channel as well. And it's doing very, very well. It's become a real stapler for, uh, for toddlers and early reading. And uh, Jennifer Garner plays the voice of Mama Lama. So uh, she's done some promotion of it as well. It's a really prideful series and prideful stories. I, I feel very uh, proud of it. What does the day in the life of Andy Hayward look like? Mm -hmm. well, that's a fun question. Thank you. Um, okay. First thing I do is I get up and I say some prayers. I filled my morning with gratitude for uh, my, my, my blessings, my good fortune, my friends, my family the things that are so important that have been given to me and I try and uh, uh, focus on how I'm going to lead a better life and do more things for more people in a positive way and uh, reflect uh, gratitude. After that, then I like to do a little bit of deep breathing and meditating and uh, mindfulness just to kind of center myself and uh, my, my day is pretty insane. And I, if I don't start it off in a grounded way uh, with some, some mindfulness, then it can get uh, a little nutso. So I do that. And then I uh, make myself a breakfast. And the breakfast is a very high nutrition breakfast. It's, it's nuts, it's seeds, it's berries, it's oatmeal. It's a couple of uh, different teas that I mix together that are, are, are healthy teas. And, uh, and some juices that uh, I'm very fortunate. Uh, my wife makes for me. A, uh, a fresh celery juice. She squeezes a fresh lemon uh, for me. And then I have a, a beet, carrot, apple, and uh, beet, carrot, apple, and, and celery juice as well. And uh, then I'm pretty much ready to start my day. And then I, I get on the computer and I see uh, what has come in overnight. We produce our animated programs pretty much all around the world. The animation is done in China. Some of the post-production is done in Ireland. We have our, here in the U.S., our team is based in L.A., Florida, and uh, Toronto, and Boston. So I'm checking in with everybody. And then we have a variety of different staff meetings, and they go on throughout the day. I try to respond to the various emails that are coming in. I check a little bit of social media so I can see uh, what the people who are watching our shows and talking about our shows are talking about. And then I, you know, look at the stock market and see how our stock is doing. We're a public company, GNUS on NASDAQ exchange. And I follow that and I try to talk to uh, our, our bankers and our business people. And uh, before I know it, uh, it's uh, six o'clock. When six o'clock comes, I meet with my wife and uh, we start our exercising. We either do a five mile walk or we uh, go to the gym and then do a five mile walk. One way or the other, we're doing five miles every single day. I like to go to the gym, I do, I do stretching, uh, I do cardio, and then I do uh, uh, light weights, and then I uh, uh, get out and, and, and I do a walk. Uh, the walk is wonderful, it unwinds my brain, and we get to uh, spend some quality time where we uh, just share about our day and things that are going on in our heads. And uh, it's a, my wife is a blessing in my life. I'm very, very fortunate. So, so Regina, As you know, because you know her. <laughs> Regina is an amazing person. So shout out to her, shout out to her. Recently, you've had a major influx in the genus stock. What do you credit that to? And what do you have to say for everyone who has been maybe pressuring or maybe real excited about the stock? Well, you know, the stock market, you have to run the company for the company, not for the stock market. Uh, if you take care of your business, the stock will eventually take care of itself. Warren Buffett uh, has taught me a lot of different things and we've done a TV series with Warren and he wrote the curriculum of the series and he does his own voice and all of that stuff. And there's so much wisdom I've gotten from him. But one thing he said is, 
when you go into the stock market, you have to pretend it's going to be closed for 10 years. And you, you have to be willing to not look at any of those shares because it's an emotional friend. And one day it can be in a good mood, one day it can be in a bad mood. And it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the underlying uh, aspects of the business. So stocks go up, stocks go down, but we're fortunate our stock is quite dramatically up from where it was a year ago, but not as high as it once was. You can't predict it, it's impossible. And I've given up doing that a long time ago. I try to be sensitive to our shareholders and be very transparent, always make sure all the information about our, our company is out there and we uh, manage our investor relationships uh, very uh, sensitively, thoughtfully, with great transparency and integrity. Warren taught me a long time ago, it takes 25 years to build a reputation, but you can lose it in five minutes. So mindful of that, I'm very uh, careful of what I say and what I do and, uh, and how I interact with people, particularly in the stock market. Absolutely, absolutely. You graduated from UCLA in 1975. Talk about your experiences as a Bruin and how it impacted you for later on in life. Well, I was very fortunate because I grew up in Los Angeles and I loved UCLA. I always wanted to go to UCLA, but I also wanted to have the experience of going away to school. So uh, as it turned out, when I graduated high school, my parents moved to London for eight years. So I was living in Los Angeles, but as essentially someone who was living away from home. Uh, I loved UCLA, it was a beautiful experience. I have friendships that I made there, which I treasure and uh, will have my whole life. Uh, it's one of those uh, beautiful, beautiful campuses, as you well know, you can go anywhere. It's just, uh, it, it's, it's a very special and wonderful place with so many options and opportunities. When I went to school, you won't believe this, but trust me, the tuition was $80 a quarter, eight zero, really? $240 a year for three quarters of school. Really? So it, I did yeah, not know that. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. No, it was, it was uh, very, very uh, easy for anybody to go there who had uh, the grades. You, I mean, and uh, today, of course, it's gotten extremely competitive. Uh, I don't know if I would get into UCLA if I applied today. I don't think I, I, don't think <laughs> I, I would. Think, I think you'd be all right, man. I think you'd be all right. I think you'd make the cut. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I'm very blessed. I had a wonderful time there. And my experience with UCLA continues. Uh, I'm a very active alumni. I'm involved in a number of different departments. And uh, I uh, care a great deal about the school. It's, it's uh, been a blessing in my life and the friends as well there. Who or what inspired you to pursue a career in animated TV? Well, um, I wanted to be a writer. That was always my interest. And I had an opportunity to, uh, to work at Hanna-Barbera Cartoons in, uh, right after school. But the only job that was available there was working in the warehouse, cleaning the warehouse. So I thought, I'm gonna get a job in the warehouse and then I'm going to find a way to work my way in with my story ideas. So uh, I was in there and, you know, every day I'd be, you know, uh, doing moving boxes and sorting things out and whatever had to be done working in their warehouse. And one day Joe Barbera came in there and uh, he used to call me kid. And he'd say, you know, I've got all these boxes of animated cells over there. Hannah wants to throw them out but I think they're going to be worth something someday. The animated cells are the hand-painted acetate drawings, which are photographed. And based on the photographs, one after another, after another, very quickly, the movement is shown that becomes the animated cartoons. So those cells were kind of the byproduct of the cartoons. And there were millions of them. Literally, there were 15,000 in every half hour show. They later became very valuable and people wanted to collect the animated cells. I have a collection of my cells as well. Anyway, Barbara told me to put them away somewhere. Years later, he told me, you remember those animated cells? I said, of course, Joe. He said, those cells, I now go to Warner Brothers store openings and sign autographs on them on weekends. And he made some crazy amount of money just from signing autographs on old Flintstones and Jetsons and Yogi Bear and Scooby-Doo and all of those things. 
So uh, I worked in the warehouse and eventually I was submitting ideas uh, to Joe Barbera's secretary. And uh, one year uh, they had just so many shows that they sold that uh, they needed more writing support than I was uh, told I had an opportunity to come up as a uh, novice writer out of the warehouse. And I worked underneath uh, Joe Barbera and he helped me to learn my craft, how to uh, develop the storylines, how to develop and stage the gags. And he would come in and review the cartoons and uh, review the stories. He'd pitch me how to do it. And then I would bring it back to him exactly the way he told me. And he'd say, oh no, that's all wrong. That's, that's all wrong. I'd throw that out the window, but it might hit somebody with talent. And uh, I mean, it, it was a it was it was it was a process. But eventually, I got it right. And uh, the first series I worked on was called uh, Yogi's All Star Laugh Olympics, and it was a series with all the Hanna Barbera characters competing against each other on three different teams in sports. One was called the Yogi Yahoos. One was called the Scooby Doobies. And the other were called the Really Rottens, which were the villains. And the series was successful. It was on uh, ABC. And uh, that just led to other series. I worked at Hanna-Barbera for three or four more years as a writer and eventually a, a producer. And I thought, hmm, this isn't that hard. I think I could do this myself. I thought I'm going to start my own company. I had an opportunity to do so with a gentleman I met who lived in Paris and shared the studio in China that Hanna-Barbera used with Hanna-Barbera. And he said, why don't you come here? I spoke French, uh, which I learned at UCLA. And uh, why don't you come here and live in Paris? And uh, we will uh, start a new cartoon company together. And that cartoon company became DIC, D-I-C. And eventually uh, we did over 5,000 half hours of cartoons. Inspector Gadget, Alvin the Chipmunks, Hello Kitty. Super Mario Brothers, Sonic the Hedgehog, Captain Planet, G.I. Joe, Madeline, Carmen Sandiego, Strawberry Shortcake, Care Bears. Uh, it just went on and on and on. We produced so many shows and uh, uh, and here I am and I'm still producing cartoons, so. You, you, you helped co-create and write some of the most iconic cartoons in the history of animated television. Is there a ritual or routine that you follow before you begin the writing process? It's got to be something that I feel will be able to get an audience. And it has to ha have a story that I feel needs to be told. I have a big sign in my office in LA that says, why must this story be told? If I don't have a reason that I can answer that with, then I just move on, find something else especially today, I'm trying to focus on what I call content with a purpose, things that have some advancement for children, some kind of enrichment in them. If there's no purpose other than just, uh, you know, a bunch of gags and, and, and I can't do the story about the evil twin brother anymore. I've done it too many times. <laughs> I need to have some kind of story that, you know, really promotes some kind of value and uh, that I can feel good about. Uh, and then, you know, you know, we sit down and we have a toolbox and it's, we take out all the tools and it's conflict and crisis and jeopardy and humor and comedy and uh, physical uh, gags. And, you know, we uh, kind of cast them into the storyline. Jeopardy, what's at stake? They're, these are all the pieces of writing. And uh, uh, my father was a writer and I remember him telling me, writers write, doesn't matter. You need to have the discipline to do it. Every day, you've got to get up and write. In fact, now I've been a producer for, for many years, but when people ask me what I do, oftentimes I'll just say I'm a writer because I really feel most importantly, everything is about story. You are the Inspector Gadget. How did the idea for Inspector Gadget come about? That's funny. Well, uh, when I worked at Hanna-Barbera, I worked on a, a number of cartoons there, one of which was called Blue Falcon and Dynamut. Blue Falcon was a superhero who was a little bit, he kind of took himself a little too seriously. And uh, the real person who was doing all the super heroics for him was his dog called Dynamut. So that inspired me a little bit. Inspector Gadget has a dog called Brain. 
So it was a little bit of uh, Blue Falcon and Dynamite, a little bit of the Pink Panther, a little bit of James Bond, a little bit of the Six Million Dollar Man, a little bit of Get Smart. I kind of, you know, had a bunch of things that were traveling around in my head at the same time. And uh, I was living in Paris. It just, uh, it just kind of came to me. Did you foresee yourself becoming the person you are today when you was that kid at UCLA? No, I never thought I'd be in animation. That was not something. Uh, really? No, it really wasn't. I thought I would be writing. But in the beginning, I really didn't know where I was going for sure and what I would do. But I had uh, the good fortune of some strong influences that I met when I was at school that encouraged me in learning. I enjoyed school a great deal, and I think I got a lot out of it. And I still, I, I, I love to read. Reading's very important to me. So... Currently, I'm reading the book Mastery by Robert Greene, and he states that for someone to master something, they have to have a passion and love for it. I consider you a master at what you do. You're a master writer, you're, an, you're a master animator producer. Do you love what you do? And do you view it as work or do you just view it as something you love to do? It's a good question. And I do love what I do. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a privilege for me. And it's an honor for me to be able to get up and every day have a job that I actually enjoy and that I can make a living from and, uh, and I've done well from. So I have to look at that as a uh, opportunity to also give back to other people and to make the world a better place. In your mind, what do you view as through all these successes, your greatest accomplishment? Well, I'm going to answer you uh, personally and professionally. My greatest accomplishment personally is, I'm going to say, trying to be the best person I can every day. The best husband that I can be, the best friend that I can be, the best boss that I can be in my company, uh, the best father that I can be. I have, as you know, I have a little 12 year old daughter. I have older kids as well that are joys and, 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 and precious to me beyond words. But I also have a little 12 year old and that's a super duper big responsibility that I take seriously and in every way that I can help her and bring value and light to guide her as she goes forward into adulthood. Um, professionally, I've done a lot of programs, but there are a few, and it's hard to say what would be my favorite. I really wouldn't say my favorite, but there's one program that stands out for me that I'm particularly proud of, and that was a show called Our Friend Martin, and it was an animated program on the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, the only one that was ever done on Dr. Martin Luther King, and uh, my son Michael who is 33 now big Clippers fan by the way we'll have to do, do something about how's that he, how's he doing how's he doing <laughs> well uh, <laughs> the, the Clippers aren't doing so great I, don't, yeah, I know I, so he must not be doing great because that was bad that was a disappointment this year um <laughs> my son Michael when he was uh, uh in grade school I think he was about uh fifth grade, he said to me, Dad, you do so many cartoons that are specials, Christmas specials and Halloween specials and holidays of this and that. There's never been a special done on the life of Dr. Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Why haven't you done that? And I really didn't have an answer for him. So uh, I thought this should be done. It's an important story to be told. And I reached out to the family of Dr. King and uh, through uh, a number of different ways I was able eventually to get there to them. And I presented them with the idea of doing a show that would introduce to young kids of all races, the legacy of Dr. King and the civil rights movement, which is an important story that needs to be told and retold for each new generation. And uh, we developed a program, we produced it. We did it with the family, Dexter King, Dr. King's, one of Dr. King's sons played the voice of his father. Oprah Winfrey played the voice of Coretta King. We had a number of celebrities in there, ranging from Samuel L. Jackson, LeVar Burton, 
uh, Jaleel White, who you know probably is a uh, big okay. UCLA Bruin fan. Yeah, you'll see him sometimes. He'll, he'll, he'll be courtside at Pauley Pavilion. Uh, he played a voice in it. He also, by the way, piece of trivia for you, uh, Jaleel's a very dear friend who introduced my wife, Regina, and myself to each other. Uh, and yep. he played the voice of Sonic the Hedgehog in every one of my Sonic the Hedgehog cartoons over 150 half hours. He's Sonic um, the Hedgehog. I did not know that. Yes, he wow, is. Wow, I you, did not know that. Okay. Go go look at an episode and listen to that voice. Uh, you can see it on Cartoon. Oh, no, you can't see it on Cartoon Channel. Where can you see it? I'll find out and let you know. But that's his voice. Anyway, he was he was in uh, our friend Martin, and we had tremendous music people in it, and uh, who John Travolta was in it, and uh, Angela Bassett and Ashley Judd. It was a, it was just a very very prideful piece, and we had a premiere of it at the King Center in Atlanta that uh, uh, with Mrs. King, Coretta King was, was alive at the time and we hosted it uh, with her and Dr. Desmond Tutu, the Nobel laureate, uh, Reverend Tutu was in it, uh, was there. And uh, it's played all over. I, I can't tell you how many times people tell me that, you know, they grew up with this in school. Uh, the Our Friend Martin. So that's probably one of the things that I've done that I'm, if not the thing that I'm most proud of and, and uh, feel best about. Uh, I, 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 can, I think I can look back on the cartoons that we've made and that we continue to make and that we will make and say, these are things that bring some positivity and smiles and into people's life and a little bit of enrichment. Genius Brand is producing the late great Stan Lee's superhero kindergarten. How important is that for you? And also speak on the relationship that you and Stan Lee had. Well, Stan obviously was an icon. He was a mentor to me, much like a father. And uh, I had the privilege of knowing and working with him for many years. And I always wanted to be the steward of his name uh, when he was not with us anymore. And I'm very fortunate and blessed to be able to do that now. We recently acquired everything of Stan Lee, the name, his physical likeness, his animated likeness, his signature, anything to do with how we merchandise him and the ability to bring new shows out under the name Stan Lee Universe or Stan Lee Presents. 2022 is going to be Stan's 100th birthday and we're going to launch a Stan Lee Centennial with a very significant amount of uh, celebration and, 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 and things around his life. We're going to announce something shortly we're gonna do with Marvel uh, with Stan. And uh, he's uh, somebody very uh, sacred to me. Stan Lee's Superhero Kindergarten was the last property that he created. He was very prescient and always had his finger on the pulse of society and the, the pop culture. And he was a brilliant storyteller, obviously. It goes without saying, he's probably the most successful storyteller of all time. If you think of Spider-Man, Iron Man, Black Panther, Guardians of the Galaxy, Thor, the Avengers. Uh, he uh, created five of the top 12 most successful movies of all time, including the number one movie box office of all time, Avengers Endgame. So uh, what an extraordinary legacy that he has. And the last thing that he created was Superhero Kindergarten because the world of superheroes is getting very crowded right now. And Stan's thought was, wouldn't it be great if we could do something where we had, imagine Batman or Iron Man or Spider-Man, what would they be like if they were kindergarten kids? Well, that's what this story is about. A group of kids have amazing superpowers, but they don't quite know how to use them yet. You know, Spider-Man, they say, with great power comes great responsibility. In superhero kindergarten, we say, with great power comes great mess. Arnold Schwarzenegger was the only person that Stan had in mind who could be the teacher of this class. And we cast him as a former superhero himself. He and Stan were great friends and uh, uh, was one of the great collaborations that we developed uh, together before Stan passed away. And uh, Superhero Kindergarten will be coming out uh, this coming fall on uh, Cartoon Channel. We're gonna tease it in December, and then it'll be wide in the spring of 2021. 
and you'll see, you know, all the products, the toys and the video games and music and publishing and backpacks and sleepwear and all of those various things that, uh, that come forth from successful animated products. For someone who is as successful as you are, you are an extremely humble and kind human being. And that's just not normal. I hate to say it, but it's not normal amongst people who have reached your level of success. How important is it for you to give back and remain humble through it all? I wish I could live up to your kind words. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm trying to think. I think it was a quote from Abraham Lincoln, or maybe fame is so short-lived. You come into this world with nothing. You leave with nothing. You want to try and be as kind and, 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 and good and, 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 and giving and, 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 and show humility in every way that you can. My parents, in my prayers I do every morning, one of the things I do is a salutation to my parents who are not with me anymore, but I learned from them to be kind to everybody, to show you know a smile to everybody, to give back to everybody. And uh, you know, there's no bigger joy in life than giving to others and providing service to others. You hear it from everywhere. Any wise person that you read, you see the same lessons, whether it's Dr. King or Abraham Lincoln or Gandhi or whatever. Service to others is very, very important. And I do my best and I try to live that way uh, as best I can every day. What inspires you to keep going today, even through all of these successes? Well, I always like telling stories, whether it's Shakespeare's Macbeth or it's an episode of Scooby-Doo, you still have to have conflict. You still have to have jeopardy. You still have to have protagonist and an antagonist. You still have to have conflict. You still have to have resolution. And I enjoy telling stories and making these stories in the animated cartoon form. Every day I get up and I'm thinking about what is the, what are, what are the programs we're working on today? How are we going to make them better? Who's going to be the voices? Who, who is going to do the writing? Superhero Kindergarten, I have to say, by the way, we have directed by John Landis, one of the great directors of all time. He did, as you may know, uh, oh my God, he did Animal House, he did Blues Brothers, he did Coming to America, he did Three Amigos, he did Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, he did Michael Jackson's Thriller video. He's doing the directing on this show. So I'm so excited about that. And then we have the writer, Steve Banks, who wrote SpongeBob SquarePants, which is one of the greatest uh, cartoons ever made. And he's doing all of our writing. So I'm excited about what we're working on. If I wasn't excited about it, I would find you know something else to do. I just enjoy very much uh, the work that, uh, and as I say, you know, bringing positive things forth for kids. It's a, a very, we have a very uh, impressionable constituency we serve. And these are, you know, these are challenging times we live in right now. So there's no mincing words about it. We're amidst a lot of uh, change and, and uh, the, not just the pandemic, but, you know, the social issues that are going on now. And everybody has their responsibility to contribute to make the world a better place. You know, we, we can do it on a large scale. We can do it on a small scale. You know, just a, a smile to the person that you meet on the street is is so valuable. I can't tell you how how special I think just the simple act of smiling is. And I love your smile, by the way. It's terrific. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you, Andy. You said once in the interview, if you have a good product, the licensing will continue and live for years and years, constantly being recycled and rediscovered by a new generation of kids. Can you elaborate just a little bit more on what you meant by that? Probably the best example I can think of in my profession is Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry was made in 1939. That's when it began. It, you couldn't be more simple. A cat and a mouse. It's the, <laughs> as simple as it gets. Kids see Tom and Jerry today, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds. They discover it fresh for the first time they're not thinking this is something old that was made that my grandparents and their parents saw. They're just seeing it as, you know, a, a fun, entertaining cartoon. And yet it will continue and go on and on for their kids and their kids' kids. If you have a good story 
and you have something worth seeing, it's going to last and last and last. One of the first cartoons I wrote on was Scooby-Doo. And that was, uh, I'm going to say about 1980-ish. Scoob or less earlier, earlier than 1980, actually. Scooby-Doo is still very, very successful today. Kids love it. Successful things will continue to relive in, in, in animation. They will, uh, they have a very evergreen and international uh, appeal. I can't tell you how many times I'm traveling outside the United States and somebody will mention something about Inspector Gadget or Sonic the Hedgehog or Captain Planet or one of the shows. Uh, the cartoons tend to be very international. Scooby Doo. Sonic the Hedgehog, Tom and Jerry. Those are shows that I remember watching when I was a kid. The show to meet the man who produced, helped produce them and write them is, is amazing, for real. What is next for Genius Brand? What do you foresee in the future? I'm not trying to produce many, many programs. I don't want to put a lot of cars on the train. I want to have a short train that's going to go very fast. So we're working on doing maybe two or three shows a year, two or three different program series a year and making them all very, very special, developing the consumer products programs that go with them and delivering them internationally, taking advantage of all of the new and emerging technologies and distribution systems that are out there. But at the end of the day, telling positive stories that are going to uplift people. Because we're a public company, I am not allowed to say things that have not been publicly announced yet. But I can tell you that we've got a couple of shows that are very important that we will be announcing in the coming, uh, hopefully, couple of weeks uh, with very important uh, celebrities that have got tremendous uh, positivity to them, licensing going on with them, stories that I think have not yet been told and that need to be told that are in sync with the times. What is your favorite quote and why does it resonate with you? Oh my God, that's a really good, good question and a hard question because I love quotes. I have actually a file of quotes. You sent me, you sent me a Mother phone. Teresa quote that the day. I thought that was amazing. Well, I have, you know, some quotes from, from Warren Buffett that I love. I have some quotes from Winston Churchill that I love. One from Winston Churchill that, uh, that's very inspiring to me is never give up, never give up, never, never give up. And uh, there are times when, you know, we all face challenges, hardships, things that uh, are demoralizing to us. And, uh, you know, the human spirit is very special. And I think we just need to remember that and not forget it and uh, always move forward and bring bring positivity and bring smiles and try and make the world a better place than it was before we were there what would you say is the most difficult challenges that you face today <clears throat> as the ceo of genius brands international i think you know it's important that you work for the shareholders management of the company works for the shareholders and you have to remember that the shareholders are there, they are your bosses and you have to be thoughtful and sensitive to them. Uh, at the same time, you have to bring leadership and produce things that are going to create value. Value does not necessarily appear overnight. Some of the things that uh, I think, you know, if I'm not mistaken, Amazon didn't make a profit until three years ago. They were in business for 20 years. It's uh, either Amazon or Apple is the most valuable company in the world today. Uh, and yet it took them so long before they were profitable. We are investing in intellectual property. And sometimes it takes uh, four, five, six years to have one of those brands succeed. And they won't all succeed in any case. We have a portfolio and we have to be mindful that a portfolio has some things that work and some things that don't work. So I think it's having patience having uh, uh, a, a sound financial structure and knowing that you've got enough money in place to get to where you need to do. Uh, these are important things. And uh, I try to be thoughtful of our, of our shareholders and at the same time provide leadership that, uh, that uh, they uh, will believe in. 
And if they don't, they shouldn't be shareholders of the company. Running a public company, at the end of the day, you need to drive profitability and create value. And that's what I'm, what I'm focused on. And at the same time, of course, producing our products that create entertainment and positive values for children. What is a common misconception about just your life? Everyone sees the good, but people technically don't see the other side. So would you elaborate on the other side? I'm an optimist, so I'm always going to say I look look at the good and I try to see the good in everything and try and find positivity in everything. I'm trying to find where's there something that is the other side. And I'm not going to, I don't want to go there because I just, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, we need to live our lives lives, you know, looking for the goodness and looking for the light and thinking about positivity. And when we have challenges, whether they are in business or whether they are in personal, uh, we need to find our ways to work through them and bring the right type of energy and, 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 and positive attitudes. It's the same as anything. If you're an athlete, you're going to find, you know, times where things didn't work out as you want them to work out. Uh, and you can stay in that place or you can find uh you know as they say you know when life gives you lemons you know you make lemonade uh i think you need to uh always look at how you're going to turn something that is a challenge into a victory and it's always available to us if we want to i, I think it's important to stay around people that bring positive energy and don't let uh negative forces uh get get around you that's just not good what is one word to describe Andy Hayward? Grateful. Grateful. I love it. Andy Hayward, I appreciate you for coming on. Um, you're one of my favorite people. You've been a mentor to me ever since I've met you. You've been amazing to me, and I appreciate you coming on the podcast. You embody the term craft master, and I look forward to seeing you soon, man. I appreciate you. My privilege, my pleasure, and my honor. Thank you, Prince. You're a wonderful person, and I'm blessed to have you in my life. Keep your composure, can't let nothing hold you, fold you, run it over any obstacle. Ain't nothing stopping you from perfecting your craft, just get in your bag, show the world what you're made of. Craft mastery, ain't no rapper mad as me, insane, dedicated like Nipsey, hustle harder than gypsies. Listen close, I am a craft master, grind now, and know the shine coming after.